Good afternoon. My name is Eleanor Mackay from SJP Business Media and Electronics World. As a company, E2V partners with its customers to improve, save and protect people's lives. Its innovations lead developments in communications, aerospace, discovery, healthcare and the environment. In this webinar, in association with Electronics World, Nicholas Chantier of E2V will discuss introducing software-defined microsystems and pushing the boundaries of RF to digital frequencies. Should there be any questions, Mark Stackler, Application Engineer at ETV, will assist Nicholas answering your questions at the end of the presentation. Over to you, Nicholas. So on the agenda, we'll be covering um, seven topics, uh, or actually six topics, uh, certification of the RF signal chain, multi micro zone D2A converters, uh, we will look at then the point number three, multi nitrous on these converters and their bandwidth limitation. That's an important thing to, to understand when we design software defined microwave systems. Uh, we look at pre distortion to seek for flat frequency response. Uh, we look at uh, DAC output power versus nitrous zones and different operating modes. And we look more closely at the case of one particular DAC, uh, a recent release from E2D. EV12 DS400 and its measured performance. And we'll probably look at some application example as well. And we'll be open for questions. Uh, if you have any questions, post webinar. Uh, we uh, will remind you uh, the email address uh, of our application engineer, uh, Mark, who's here, and also uh, Roman Sackler, uh, Roman Pilar, uh, on the team, who will take uh, any technical questions uh, after the webinar. Uh, so on, on this slide, uh, we, we make a comparison between traditional system at the top of the chart and what, what is enabled in terms of software-defined microwave system with uh, the latest generation B2A converters. So we, with the emergence of ultra-wideband DACs that are capable of operating at microwave frequency, that will enable the simplification of uh, RF hardware, obviously. Uh, a lot of what uh, previously uh, was required to be built in uh, as complex RF uh, hardware can now be done in the software domain. So we see at the top we had many channelization uh, to achieve uh, you know, wide bandwidth and we had to separate that in many channels, um, made a large real estate requirement and lots of channels that can now be done uh, with one and travel band device uh, in, um, as, as shown in the, uh, at the bottom of the chart. And also a lot of the um, frequency uh, conversion, the mixers, and um, a, good, a good number of the RF circuitry, a uh, good part of it, can be done in a software domain uh, in a DSP unit at the, at the bottom of the chart. So that simplifies significantly uh, the RF signal chain, uh, as you can see uh, on, uh, on the diagram at the bottom of the chart. Okay. Moving to slide four. There, um, it's a reminder of, of um, fundamental things that we need to understand when we use digital to analog converters. Uh, at the top of the chart, figure A represents a typical sine wave, uh, obviously, with the vertical green lines will be sampling points. Uh, figure B is a digitized representation of it in time domain, and which obviously with high resolution DAX uh, has finer steps, steps which can be so fine that we actually don't see them on the, on the screen representation, but here for illustration purposes, we, uh, they are uh, exaggerated so that we can really see uh, the digitization, the digitization and the, the quantization steps. At the bottom of the chart, figure C, is a frequency representation uh, of, the, of the sine wave, as well as the uh, output power, which is uh, output frequency, when we use um, a, perfect, uh, a perfect DAC. And that's uh, after digital uh, to analog conversion. Uh, what is important to look at, I suggest you pay attention to uh, the various nitrate zone, NZ1, NZ2, NZ3, NZ4, NZ5, that are represented at the bottom there. Uh, looks like the above them, you'll see uh, the half frequency, uh, sampling frequency line that is shown for the limit of first nitrate zone. So if we look at nitrate zone 1, we see a, a big uh, solid uh, line through the beginning of the night zone, uh, which is a, a sine wave. Uh, when we look at the second night zone, uh, night zone two, 
we see uh, an image of that uh, in um, the images which are, are shown there. It's important to understand that uh, on even uh, microsomes like NV2, NV4, these uh, the spectral representation is uh, is flipped. So uh, what was a low frequency in microsome one is at towards the high end of a microsome in microsome two, and vice versa. It's like a mirror effect. That's what we call the the images. It's important to keep this mirror effect in mind because when you define the content of your um, uh, what, which uh, signals you put inside the microsome, it's important to understand that there is this mirroring effect if you choose to work in microsome 2 or microsome 3. Slide 5, um, we're showing on CVD, uh, we introduce uh, the idea that uh, DACs are not perfect. Uh, their output stage behaves like a low pass filter. Uh, we see the case of DAC1, which uh, uh, I'm showing the uh, a very simple, simplified representation of the output stage frequency response. It would cut off, it would be the first one to cut off that uh, um, some frequency that needs to be defined if we compare to the uh, uh, the bottom chart. It's um, after, in, in the second episode, it's cutting. Uh, DAC2, which uh, has a, could be a similar DAC, but would be in this example a DAC with a much higher output bandwidth. Uh, it would behave, its output stage will behave like a low pass filter cutting off after, um, in, in the fifth acry zone, after two times sampling frequency, two times like that. It's important to keep in mind uh, the, the fact that um, DACs have a cut off frequency. Uh, most of the DACs, uh, they are designed to cut off in the second acry zone, third acry zone. Sometimes it's not on purpose, sometimes it's due to, to, to the technology. Uh, but, but the latest data that uh, we've developed at E2V uh, are interesting in the sense that they, uh, they have a very high output bandwidth in the range of 7 gigahertz. So that, that's a pretty high cut of frequency. It's, uh, it's the example we show on DAC2 here. And what this means is that the output of a DAC, you have now multiple DAC zones. DAC zone 1, 2, 3, and 4 are fully fitting inside the, uh, the bandwidth. DAC zone 5 is where the uh, the output stage um, low pass behavior will start to cut off. Okay, uh, that, that's something that's very uh, very important to understand. Um, on the chart E at the bottom there, we uh, also represent uh, the output power versus uh, output frequency, uh, which um, is a phenomenon called sinc x or sinus x over x. Um, it's, a, it's classic with every DAC, but when we work uh, often with um, DACs in first macro zone, because that's often the only macro zone that we can support, you don't really worry too much about the sine X phenomenon. It, it, it uh, reduces the output power towards the end of an macro zone number one. Uh, but if you don't work in macro zone two, three, four, you don't really suffer much from that. Uh, now, if you work in multiple nitrogen with the DAC, you really have to understand this phenomenon of uh, sinc x or sinus x over x because it really uh, affects um, in a significant uh, manner the output power that you will have at the output of the DAC. So it's just reminding the, uh, the basic thing. I'm moving now to slide number six, just waiting for you to, to add it on your, on your screen as well. There we go. Uh, it's the um, simplified idea of pre-distortion. We can look at this in, in many ways. But before the DAC, uh, on chart F in red, I'm showing the uh, effect of the sine x over x phenomenon, which is a, a, a reduction of the output power towards the end uh, of the first Nyquist. That's a natural behavior of, due to the sine x over x phenomenon in, in one uh, over, or output mode of the DAC. In uh, chart G, in blue, we're showing the reverse effect of that. And uh, this is something you can define in, your, in the software domain, in your FPGA or signal processing unit, if you, if you choose an ASIC instead of an FPGA. And what's interesting is when you multiply F times G, you have an H at the bottom there, which is a, a flat frequency response. So that's a, so a technique that is used uh, to compensate for the sinus X over X phenomenon of the output of a DAC. It, obviously, when we choose to do this, there are, there are trade-offs. Usually, the available output power is reduced to some extent. Uh, but the big benefit is to provide flat frequency response, really. 
so there we we show that uh, that's uh, the, as per the latest one from from E2V uh, have four different output modes uh, with different profiles of output power versus output frequency. Uh, they are shown here in the frequency domain, and uh, they can also be represented in, uh, in the time domain. And this is very useful to work across multiple lab zones with the pads which have a high output power. That's why we, uh, we pay attention to, to these modes when we, uh, we design this part. So it's important to consider which mode is best depending on the lab zone you choose to work on. That's really dependent on your system frequency plan. Uh, at the top of the chart, you see uh, uh, the, the NRZ long return to zero and RTZ. Uh, the shape of these uh, are purely dependent on the clock frequency. Uh, so it's, it's directly related to the clock frequency, and these shapes can be calculated using uh, formulas. So, depending on which type of you want to work, you can choose uh, either one of these modes. At the bottom, you see the uh, NRTZ, which is narrow return to zero mode. And uh, to the right, the RF mode, which is another mode. And there, what's uh, important to, to understand is that uh, the shape of these, uh, the frequency response is dependent on, uh, on the clock frequency, but it is, also, it is also dependent on the pulse reshaping parameters. So this is a new thing on, on the latest DAC from E2V that we, uh, we are, uh, never announced in December. Um, it has pulse reshaping parameters that uh, as a user you can change and depending on the settings you, you apply, you will have a different uh, position of the zero energy point. So if you look at the NRTZ mode, or let's look at RF mode instead. So you, you can see the leftmost uh, zero point, uh, zero energy point is obtained with uh, certain settings of the pulse reshaping uh, width and pulse reshaping settings. When you change the pulse reshaping, reshaping parameters, you can change the zero energy point to the left or to a different position. It's just an SPI setting on the DAC, and that's quite convenient to help you in the frequency planning. It works uh, similar in a similar way in an RTZ and RF mode. It's just the uh, overall formula is, is different. Um, but it's, uh, these pictures are, are very important to understand. It's the first time you're working with a multi is on D2A converters. On slide eight, you will see um, a table um, that compares the different output modes. I'm waiting for this to come to your screen. Yeah, it goes, yes. So it gives you the uh, ONZ, ONZ column, uh, indicates the optimum micro zone for each uh, output mode. So if you wish to work in the first micro zone, you see uh, not. NRZ mode, NRZ mode is a good one. NRTZ can also be used. Um, and it gives you a good combination of uh, what are the uh, optimal mechanisms for each mode, the advantages of each of these four modes, and the trade off. What are the things you should pay attention to that uh, uh, need to be uh, taken care of if you choose one mode or the other? And uh, we also show to the left of the table, the post reshaping features that are available depending on the, on the modes. Move on now to <coughs> slide number nine. Uh, this slide simply describes uh, the time domain representation of two of the four modes, uh, as well as the frequency domain formula. So you've seen the shapes in the frequency domain. They are defined by the formula that you have uh, on the left hand side uh, on the screen for each of these two modes. And uh, we found the representation on the left is also interesting to show you the time domain uh, behavior of each of these modes. Uh, on the next slide, uh, slide 10, it's a similar representation for the uh, two, the other two modes. Uh, so there, there we are. NRTZ, now we'll return to zero mode at the top, and RF mode at the bottom. You see in time domain, the pulses have a totally different shape, and the energy they provide in the RF domain is, is also very different. And that's why also the, uh, the formula, the equation that we provide to calculate these output power, which is output frequency, are, are very, uh, very different. And to help you make these calculations, uh, we'll see on the next slide, we are providing uh, 
simulation models. Uh, there it is, it's coming on your screen. Uh, Scilab models, um, some of you may know Scilab. It's uh, an open source uh, mathematical tool. Uh, many are used to MATLAB. Um, you could think of an open source uh, comparable software to MATLAB. And for, but this one is called Scilab, and we provide a macro that you can use uh, in Scilab, which when you open it, uh, it uh, screenshots uh, number two, it prompts you to fill the various parameters, which mode of the data you want to use, or sampling frequency, output bandwidth, that's pre-filled in default with uh, the 7 gigahertz of it to be that, uh, number of night reasons you want to plot, and the pulse reshaping parameters uh, uh, that are built in, in the data sheet. You can enter different values there and try, try and see what happens, and play, click uh, on OK, and it will plot, uh, as an example we show on slide, uh, on point number three, it will plot in the frequency domain uh, the output power versus output frequency that you obtain in, uh, in different modes. And uh, the example shows only one mode, but uh, the macro will provide you plots for all of the four modes. And we think that's uh, no, it's quite convenient uh, for you to quickly have a look at the frequency response of the DAC in different uh, frequency plan uh, situation. If you don't want to, uh, to play with the equation manually yourself. Uh, now we should be on slide, uh, slide number 12. Uh, we're on slide number 12, which here is, uh, we show a simplified view of uh, the fact that multiple magnetic zones are available at the output of these modern D2A converters. And that this, um, it's important to remember that this allows for removal of frequency at converters in L-band, S-band, and C-band with the current state of the r D2A converters, 12-bit uh, resolution. In, in this example there, because the latest DAC that uh, we released um, at the 2 uh, have this low-pass low filter cut off frequency at 7 gigahertz. This fifth night zone in this example here, when we got that video sample, the fifth night zone is partially covered. So it, it's still available to be used, but you have to understand you have a reduced dynamic range in, in this uh, fifth night zone. But for some systems, like the synthetic aperture radar for 3D imagery um, uh, from, from a satellite or from a UAV, it, it still is a sufficient um, amount of dynamic range. And it still can be a very good idea to design a system without uh, frequency up converters and without mixtures in, uh, in frequencies up to 7, 7.5, or maybe up to 8 gigahertz as well. So here we show a theoretical example of frequency hopping uh, encryption that is possible inside an accurate zone. I think it, it's important to, to talk about that because these. Um, uh, the, the state of the art later D2A converters at microwave frequency have an uh, amazing capability for frequency hopping. And keep in mind, this is a theor theoretical example. The real life implementation obviously would have to account for bandwidth limitation and, and, and other, other constraints. But um, the theoretical example is still very interesting to understand. You can assume here a 20 gigabits per second data flow coming in at the top the left corner into a, a unit uh, inside your signal processing device, which will be a channelization. So you can channelize your big data flow into subflows, in this example, from 1 to 200 data flows. That will then go into a switch matrix, uh, where you're going to switch data flow to channels. And the number of combination being factorial 200 that's a, a very large number of possible combinations. Uh, and then that will go with feed a modulation, uh, channel modulations, uh, which will then create 200 FDMA channels, which are represented at the output of the DAC at the bottom. So we see we have 200 uh, little carriers, FDMA channels here. Each of them is uh, one of the subflows. And if you wouldn't have this uh, switch matrix there, uh, flow number one could be channel number one, flow number two will be channel number two. But having this encryption switch matrix here, if you dynamically um, <coughs> switch uh, the uh, assignment, uh, the, like between the number of uh, data flow and the channel number, uh, doing this in your signal processing, you're actually doing a dynamic uh, frequency hopping in the frequency domain at the output of a DAC. 
uh, and the number of frequency hopping combination is, is again in this example factor of blood radius is a, an amazing an amazing number. Uh, think of the size of an acrison to give you an idea. When you clock, clock at three kg sample, uh, the nitrison which limits how many channels you can you can have in one uh, uh, one uh, spectrum, uh, it would be 1.5 gigahertz. So between uh, channel uh, number one and channel number 200, you could have uh, germs which would reasonably be between uh, in the range of 1.4 gigahertz. If you take a DAC like the latest ones, clock at 4.5 gigahertz, you, would, you could go. Um, work with the spectrums of uh, a bit more than two gigahertz and do frequency hop of more than two gigahertz uh, purely from from software domain uh, adjustments in your signal processing unit, and that's that's only within one one microzone. It's it's very uh, very powerful. Uh, now, put this into perspective with this uh, following slide, slide 14. Uh, you recognize at the bottom the uh, all the two other channels that we have defined in the previous slide. You could choose in the RF domain now to route some channels to different bands. So in, in this again, it's a theoretical example, but just to give you an idea of possibilities. In this example, we're routing the first channels to L band. Some of uh, the uh, intermediate channels going to uh, IF frequency, which is up convert to K band and X band. Some of us are routed to S band, some of us to C band. When we do this uh, hardwired uh, routing of channels in the RF domain, uh, then uh, every time you do change uh, channel assignment in the switch matrix on the previous slide, you're doing cross band frequency hopping encryption in, across a very wide uh, range of frequencies. Um, and that's uh, a purely software defined frequency hopping. System, uh, which um, is, is uh, amazingly powerful, and which become powerful and possible now with the availability of uh, soft, uh, microwave-capable uh, digital analog converters. I thought that's um, a very uh, powerful example of uh, what microwave-capable DAX uh, enable. In in some other applications, so that that was with the idea of doing. Um, a data link and to secure it with frequency hopping encryption. In some other example, if you are doing, for example, uh, for 3D imagery, 3D imaging purposes, a synthetic aperture radar, uh, all these channels at the bottom could be some some signals that you turn on and off to uh, increase or reduce your instantaneous bandwidth for for imaging purposes. That would, could also be software defined, and that could also be routed to different frequency bands to have a different Radar information because we you know radar backscattering is different in L band and, and, C, and F band and C band. Uh, so that would make an interesting system, not only for data communication but for other types of application that will be purely software defined and, and operating directly at microwave frequencies. Um, moving to, towards the end uh, of the session, uh, <coughs> this is a summary of the, the latest DAC uh, which has this capability. Um, from it to this, so EV12 DS400, uh, we see that it has a 7 gigahertz output bandwidth, four operating mode as described before. A typical power consumption to expect from, from this DAC is 2.6 watts, that has two power supplies. Uh, on the output, uh, this one uh, has a parallel uh, interface, LVDS interface with multiplexing, uh, muxing ratio 1 to 4, 1 to 2. Following generations will have a serial input. Uh, the output in, uh, in the analog domain, microwave domain, is one volt peak peak differential, and all the settings are done through a free wire serial interface. For full, do full documentation about uh, about the DAC and application notes and white paper, uh, we've opened a product folder on B2B.com. That's the, the link that is shared at the bottom of the page, B2B.com slash db 12 ds 400 and you'll be able to download it. All the documentation, including the uh, Scilab um, uh, simulation tool, the Scilab macro that we've shown before. In the following slide, I'll go briefly through some typical uh, measurements. Uh, you'll be able to download this presentation and you'll be able to ask us questions about this. But this is an example of a, a spurious free dynamic range in the first night zone for this DAC. So, in the first night zone, in this case, when you look at 4.5 year sample, 
he starts at zero Earth and he stops at 2.25 gigahertz. And we have a carrier here at 2.2 gigahertz, uh, and the highest uh, spurs below are 63 dBc uh, underneath, so it gives you a, a measure of the uh, SFDR. Uh, you'll see different SFDR values for different uh, output frequencies, and that is in RF mode. It's important to understand different uh, output mode of that will give you different uh, different response. So what you see on the screen is measured performance uh, of spurious free dynamic range when we use the RF mode at 4.5 dB central. And for uh, output frequencies, which cover nearly the full output bandwidth of the DAC, starting at 0, uh, 45 megahertz, all the way to 6.7 gigahertz, we are very close to the um, cutoff frequency. Uh, so that starts at 2.25 gigahertz and stops at 4.5 gigahertz. And there the carrier is at uh, 4.40, nearly 4.5 gigahertz. And we'll see the highest spurs at 61 dBc below the carrier. And that's been done in RF mode. If we choose another mode, we'll see different, uh, different performance. IMD free measurements in the first micro zone. So we have uh, two carriers, uh, one at 2 gigahertz and one 10 megahertz higher than the towers minus IDBFS. And we see image per 61 dBC, uh, which can be, uh, can be uh, lower than 61 dBC, which can be filtered if needed. This is an ID of the performance ID uh, of the IMD in the first micro zones. You see, we have a 74 dBc uh, standoff from, from the carrier to, uh, to the, the closest spur when we are zooming into the carrier signals. Uh, so we're looking at from 4.5 gigahertz to, uh, to 6, nearly, yeah, slightly above 6.7 gigahertz. We have one carrier at 6.5 gigahertz, and one 10 megahertz above. <coughs> and uh, we see image spurs um, below 55 dBc which can be filtered as well. So that's really a good, good example of what you can expect when you work uh, above 6 gigahertz, between 6 and 7 gigahertz. On slide 22, which is coming, we are zooming in on these two carriers at 6.5 gigahertz and 10 megahertz above. Uh, you see a uh, 61 dBc uh, IMD free measurement here. That's NPR stands for noise power ratio. Uh, the idea of uh, NPR, noise power ratio, is to apply, in the case of a DAC, we define a high power noise and occur across a wide bandwidth. So it's a broadband high power noise pattern that we create. And at the center of it, we create a notch, which is a zero energy notch. And by measuring how deep uh, this notch is compared to uh, to uh, the top signal. Um, we are assuming it's we are measuring. Uh, it's like if we would be measuring rejection from adjacent channels to uh, to an empty channel. And so it's a worst case scenario, and uh, NPR is a recognized um, measurement that you see on many on many components, and it's a, it's a good metric that you can find from from various suppliers to compare performance. In this example, we're doing it in the first NACWI zone. And we have it, so we see a 47.5 dB uh, and noise power ratio measurements here. Still in the first NACWI zone, and we zoomed in to 1 gigahertz to 1.64. I will go quickly to slide 26, so it's a similar measurement now. In the second micro zone, between uh, 3.335 gigahertz to 3.465 gigahertz, and then we see 39 dB uh, NPR measurements at frequencies that are relatively high in the S band area. And that was uh, all, all the slides I had for today. I think we, uh, we are open for, for questions.
Thank you, Nicholas, for that. Very interesting. Um, we have had a couple of questions come in. I'm sure there'll be some more coming after the webinar. Um, the first one was, does the sampling clock break through to the output of the DACA FS, 2FS, etc., as well as the wanted signals? Okay. I think I can hand on to, to my colleague, uh, Mark Stacker, to uh, answer these, uh, these questions now. Hello everyone, so I'm Mark Stacker, I'm the application engineer, I'll be answering the, the questions. Um, so the first one was about the, uh, the, the clock spurious will appear on the, on the spectrum, so uh, this, this depends on the mode that's used. Um, you should remember the slide that Nicolas has shown is a time response depending on the mode. Uh, I'll bring it back. So uh, let me just wait to, let's try to go back. So on the, this slide, this is slide uh, nine. Number nine. Um, so, so you can see the, the non-return to zero mode, uh, where the, uh, the, the time output uh, is uh, simply the, the sample value uh, during the, the sampling period. Uh, so with this particular mode, the sampling, the sampling frequency uh, doesn't appear on the output. Uh, then if you look at the return to zero mode, you can see the uh, this, the sampling frequency clearly appears in the, in the time domain output. Uh, you see, you see the 50% on and 50% off uh, the output that brings uh, the, the sampling frequency on the output. So you will see in the spectrum the uh, the f clock spur. And then the next uh, the next one would be uh, now return to zero. So here again, you can see in the time domain the uh, the sampling frequency appearing. Uh, it, it Less, it has less energy in this mode than the, the RTZ mode. And finally, the OF is, uh, is basically uh, you, you, are, uh, you are inputting same as RTZ. You have the, the sampling frequency appearing, uh, but it's brought by the mode. This is something that uh, can can be presented. Uh, so in, from the best one to the worst one on the f uh, an RZ would be the best one. Uh, then it will be an RTZ, then RF, and finally an RTZ mode. Uh, and that's for uh, the clock spurious, uh, that's by definition of the mode. Uh, then the, another big uh, parameter that impacts the, the clock spurious is uh, uh, the, the, the phase difference between the, the two differential outputs of the, of the DAC. Uh, any phase difference uh, there will bring energy to the clock spurious. So when uh, when these DAC are used, uh, and, and basically any differential output DAC are used, uh, making sure that the uh, difference between the P and N outputs of the differential pair are very well matched, and that includes any, any volume that might be used, uh, is, is key to, to bring uh, the, the best performance and, and reduce this, uh, this clock spirits. Okay, that's great. Thank you. We have another um, couple of questions that I'll probably put into one for you. Um, the first was, is the EV1 2DS400 commercially available now? And is there a space rated version available? Which also then leads into, can it also be pushed to work in the fourth Nyquist zone around 8.5 gigahertz? This is Nicholas. I'll, I'll take uh, this one. So the first question is, whether this DAC EV12 DS400 is available for space, uh, the answer is no for this particular one. Um, it, it's a case for the previous one, DS130, uh, but we are, yeah, say, skipping one generation. The next one after DS400 that we will start uh, designing will be planned for space. Uh, so the answer would be uh, would be yes to what. Um, what was the rest of the question? So I think you know, the other question was whether um, this device could um, Yeah, could it be pushed to work in the fourth like a zone at around 8.5 gigahertz? Okay, so this particular DAC, EV12 DS400, um, beyond 7 gigahertz, what will happen is you will um, have more than 3 dB attenuation, but it will not stop working. It will keep working. You just have more than 3 dB attenuation. Uh, at 8.5 gigahertz. So usually it, that means if you are doing a telecommunication system, probably you would not have enough dynamic range for uh, typical modulation techniques that are used in communication between 7 and 8.5 gigahertz. But if you are doing uh, other applications which require less dynamic range, 
then you could probably still use it. Uh, we know this type of application typically would be a synthetic aperture radar for imaging, 3D imagery of the, of the ground of the Earth from a satellite or from an aircraft or from a UAV. Okay, that's great. Thank you. And um, perhaps, Nicholas, if you could put back up the slide with your um, contact details on it, um, in case there are any further questions afterwards. Um, but in the meantime, I'd like to thank Nicholas um, of E2V for a very insightful presentation, which will be available on the E2V website, www.e2v.com, and also the Electronics World website, electronicsworld.co.uk. It only remains for me to thank you all for your time. Thank you very much. Good afternoon.